Welcome to the 1930s, a return to femininity. The 1930s was the Great Depression. It was a time of hunger, of bread lines, of starvation, of desperation, of mass unemployment. It was the time of the dust bowl and the dust storms. Displaced people who had lost everything, living uh, on the side of roads or in Hoovervilles. It was the time of the Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Yet it was also a time of tremendous glamour and silliness. The rich got richer as the majority got horribly poorer. So poor that some little children had to sleep in boxes. And yet Hollywood glamour was so glamorous. People wanted escapism so badly to escape from the horrible lives they were forced to lead. Fashion had never been more elegant, more sumptuous and more glamorous. And fashion had never been more pathetically heartbreaking. Let's look at it all, the good and the bad of the Great Depression. Let's start with the body ideal. It is so completely different from the 1920s, you won't believe your eyes. This is it. Sleek and slinky. Stooped shoulders, low breasts, a natural waistline and streamlined hips. What a difference to that little boxy, doll-like look of the 20s. And there you see the relationship between fashion and the ideal body. Did anyone have this body? Well, she did. She is called Jean Harlow. And she was a big movie star of the 1930s. But this silhouette played out throughout the era, for day wear, for evening wear. Even people who didn't have this naturally slinky body would try to achieve it with clothing and corsetry. Let's look at 1930s beauty, and you'll see it's incredibly different to the 1920s. Let's start with our friend, and the first thing we have to do is make her face a little bit paler with powder, and then we're going to add these incredibly high, incredibly arched, and ridiculously thin eyebrows. Then a pale and very neutral shade of eyeshadow. Color-wise, maybe, maybe mauve or a light lilac would be used. But generally, eyeshadow was kept very light because everything was about the eyelashes, false eyelashes. A more natural and quite glossy red lip. And when you put 30s hair on her, her face suddenly becomes the face of Jean Harlow. You can see what I mean. This was absolutely the beauty ideal. And there it is again, this time on Betty Davis. And there it is again, this time on Marlena Dietrich, which we'll look at in a second. And there it is again in a cosmetic ad, and you can see the sort of lilac shade that's being used there on the eye. And this was the look. Everybody went for it. And here are some contemporary adaptations of the 1930s beauty ideal. Let's look at the dominant fashion idea, one of my favorite fashion eras. And here it is. A hat was obligatory. In the 30s you did not go anywhere without your hat and gloves. An ultra-feminine dress with a fitted waist. Fur, if you could afford it, which most people couldn't. Again, your gloves obligatory. A very low hemline. And dainty little shoes. 
and this was the look. Fashion of the 30s was all about propriety, good behaviour and ladylike femininity. Rules were back and forth and the look was softly tailored with gentle prints, mostly muted colours and a delicacy that was a direct and very obvious backlash to the boyish boldness of the 20s. But why? Well, think about it. The Depression was a terrifying time. When people are frightened, they don't want to show a lot of skin, do they? So hemlines dropped. But moreover, I think that people were feeling contrite. I think they were feeling frightened. I think that the whole look of the 30s was sort of saying, oh, I'm gentle, I'm sweet, I'm nice, I'm ladylike, I'm proper. Let's all follow the rules and then maybe this hell will stop happening. I love the 1930s. It really is one of my favourite fashion eras and I think it's so much more interesting, sexier and uh, more feminine than the 20s. And if you don't believe me, just take a look at these contemporaneous fashion images. It was so slinky, so glamorous, so feminine. I love the 30s. And so do a lot of contemporary designers, because here we have the 1930s fashion idea reworked on the runway today. I would love any of these outfits. And just to reiterate this idea that looking ladylike and uh, respecting propriety, you know, good behavior, really was at the heart. Take a look at these images. Here, do note that slinky, long silhouette. And just to remind you, Hemline's plummet tailoring rules and the wild, boyish look of the 20s is replaced by a modest and sophisticated femininity. Like here, look at the long hemline and the little bag and the little shoes and the ruffled blouse. Here again, and here again, my goodness, I love that suit. And here is a slightly more dramatic take on it, with actress Joan Crawford and a rather adorable Old English sheepdog. And here it is again. It's all very neat, isn't it? I love it. I think it's so gorgeous. I love the 30s. Let's take a look at the 30s palette. See, it's very soft, it's muted, it's ladylike, it's elegant. Forget those bold hues that we saw in the 20s. This is soft, it's gentle, dusty, muted. That is the 30s palette. Yet the 30s was also playful. And I played with a lot of fun fashion ideas, like polka dots. Oh my goodness, people were crazy for polka dots in the 30s. Look at this, every woman looks her best in polka dots. Ever fresh, youthful, becoming, and always fashion right. And they always fashion were. Polka dot after polka dot after polka dot. Have you ever seen so many polka dots in a decade? People loved polka dots. That's Marlena Dietrich in a polka dot scarf. That's a young Cary Grant in a polka dot tie. And look at these polka dot shoes. While the poor were miserable and starving and living in Hoovervilles or in shanty towns or struggling through the Dust Bowl, the wealthy, because the wealthy stayed wealthy, a lot of them did, and a lot of them got wealthier, like to show off their wealth with evening wear that was so sexy, so silky, so slinky, often with sort of a metallic sheen. Take a look at these dresses. 
They're absolutely exquisite, and I'm sorry. I know so many of you girls came into this thinking, oh, I love the 20s, I love the 20s, the 20s were the best. Oh, come on. Look at these dresses. There is nothing in the 20s that is hotter than these dresses. And here are some images from the 30s of movie stars wearing these dresses. So slinky, so gorgeous, and so imitated today. Again, contemporary runway. You can really see there's nothing new, is there? Again, I would love any of these dresses. The 1930s saw the birth of backless. This was new. It was sexy. It was uh, uh, shocking. And it was gorgeous. Because look, this would not have worked, would it? You could not do backless, really, in the 20s. Even though some 20s evening dresses did have a scooped back, this is properly backless and you can't really do this with a ship dress, can you? Let's meet a style icon of the 30s, Greta Garbo. Greta Garbo was an actress. She was a movie star. She was originally from Sweden, but she came to the United States and became a big Hollywood star. And she really was the first person to do the skinny eyebrow, to do the hair that's flat on uh, the top and then curly at the bottom. And the Guinness Book of World Records declared her to be the most beautiful woman of all time ever she was extraordinary looking but in terms of fashion she was the first person ever to really embrace this kind of slouchy pant look um, she made casual extremely chic like here i would wear that today wouldn't you She's an important person to know about in terms of fashion, the incomparable Greta Garbo. And here is a quote, life would be so wonderful if we only knew what to do with it. Greta Garbo didn't really know what to do with hers. Uh, she quit Hollywood at the height of her fame and went into retirement and lived the rest of her life in retirement. She lived in New York. She'd go for walks in Central Park. She'd go to the Met, but she didn't really do anything else. So, there we have it, Greta Garbo, the most beautiful woman who has ever been, according to the Guinness Book of Records. All right, the designer of the decade. This smiling lady is Scaparelli, Elsa Scaparelli, and please note her name is pronounced Scaparelli, not Schiaparelli. She was Italian. And she designed things like this, a dress with a bustle. This is her famous tear dress. Look, if you, if you can uh, see what's happening there, it looks like the dress is being torn. Look at this incredible jacket. Uh, she designed this along with Cocteau. Scaparelli was very aligned with the surrealist art movement. She was friends with people like Dali, De Chirico, uh, Cocteau, Magritte, people you will learn about um, in your homework. Look at the jacket. You can see uh, the, the figure's hair is curving and flowing down the arm, and then her hand is reaching into the pocket. So much fun. But not as fun and sort of amazing and kind of Alexander McQueenish as this. This is Scaparelli's famous skeleton dress. It looks like the bones of a skeleton are protruding uh, through the dress. It's all done with padding. It's absolutely extraordinary. This is surrealist, but it's also very fun. A hat that looks like a shoe. And these are some of her buttons. She was very famous for doing very fun, beautiful and silly buttons. Buttons shaped like mermaids or like lips or like bugs. 
She was fun, gloves with nail polish. And what about these extraordinary furry, hairy shoes? Scap, as she was known to her friends, offered surrealist fun and silly whimsy to an increasingly frightened and desperate world. The Great Depression was devastating lives. Fascism was on the rise in Europe. The 30s was the time when uh, Mussolini in Italy, Franco in Spain, and of course Adolf Hitler in Germany were on the rise. And Scap knew all of this, and she responded with light-hearted escapism. And Coco Chanel absolutely hated her. She refused to speak her name, referring to her only as the Italian. Think about it. Uh, Chanel was all about clothing being functional and, and serious and chic. Scaparelli was about fun, glamour, whimsy. But apart from uh, Chanel, everybody else adored her. She was funny and smart and fun and generous. Everybody loved her, including the woman who would make this particularly playful Scaparelli dress world famous. The lobster dress. A great quote from Scaparelli that really explains why she worked in the 30s in the Great Depression. In difficult times, fashion is always outrageous. Do you think that's true? Let's meet our style icon, or should I say icons, because there's two of them. And there they are. Edward VIII and Mrs. Wallace Simpson. And look, she's wearing polka dots. I think you can see just from this picture why I've chosen them as style icons of the 1930s. Who were they? Well, Edward VIII was, when he met Mrs. Wallace Simpson, the Prince of Wales. He was the heir to the throne of England, of Britain. And remember, during this era, the British Empire was at its height. We already looked at the British Empire, didn't we? So he was the world's most eligible bachelor, and people could not understand why he fell in love with a divorced, not very pretty American woman who was quite brash, who um, spent tons of money on clothes, who was a bit of a party girl, and yet he was besotted by her. Here they are in action. It's a little gift for you to see them together. And uh, their relationship, their romance caused a scandal. It was an outrage. Of course, he couldn't marry her. A, a British king cannot marry a divorced woman, at least not in those days. Things are different now. Charles, uh, uh, Prince Charles married Camilla Parker Bowles and she was divorced. But back in the 30s, this was unheard of. That, there we have uh, the lobster dress. Wallace Simpson wearing it. And here she is again in another Scaparelli. And here they are together. And you can see, wow, he was a style icon too. In fact, he was in trouble constantly with the royal family for his outrageous dress sense. It was far too flashy. And there they are again together. You can see why they are fashion icons. People really imitated the way that Wallace Simpson and Edward, he was known as David in private life, uh, how they dressed. So they were lovers and it caused a scandal. She was his royal mistress. He liked buying her jewellery. Wow. He was famous for buying her jewellery. Take a look at that flamingo. It's pretty impressive as it is with emeralds and rubies and sapphires and diamonds. I think you'll be even more impressed when I tell you that it's about seven inches long. What happened? Well... Edward, when his father died, was made King of England, and that's a coin that has his name on it. He was the King of all England, Britain, and the British Empire. 
but he wasn't allowed to marry his beloved Wallace. So not very long after he was made king, he did something outrageous and shocking. It really shocked the world. He abdicated. He abdicated. He gave up the throne so that he could marry Wallace Simpson. They called it the love story of the century. That's quite a sacrifice, isn't it? He made a speech to uh, the British public or the public in the whole of his empire. And I can't remember exactly how it went, but it said he was unable to continue his duties without the woman he loved by his side or words to that effect. Everybody was outraged and sort of disgusted. Britain was on the brink of war. Fascism was on the rise, as you know. And here was our king, when we needed him the most, abdicating so he'd go off and marry this flashy, but very fashionable, American divorcee. Oh, my God. But they did marry. And this is them on their wedding day. Look at the dress that Wallace is wearing. That was the most knocked off dress that year. Everybody who got married that year after she did had an imitation of this dress. She had the color mixed, especially for the occasion, for this dress. And this was given a name, this color. They called it Windsor Blue because they became the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. So what happened? Who became king? Well, the next in line, his younger brother, George, had to become king. George wasn't trained to be king. He hadn't been raised to be king. He was shy and um, he stuttered. He was a stutterer. And so this was, oh my goodness, at such an important point of, in history when radio was the only way to uh, get a public message out before the days of television, you can imagine what a struggle this uh, young man had. And this struggle that he triumphed with and became one of England's greatest kings, he and his wife were absolutely the salt of the earth during World War II and really helped the, the British people keep their spirits up. His whole story was recently depicted in the movie The King's Speech. So that all comes together for you now, right? The Duke and Duchess of Windsor, of course, stayed married for the rest of their lives. But guess what? They were sort of exiled. He was given various posts in the, within the empire but he never set foot in England again. Wallace Simpson has a very famous quote that I think you all know. You can never be too rich or too thin. She was both all her life. Another fashion icon of the 30s that you have to be aware of is this lady, Marlene Dietrich. She was a Hollywood movie star, although she was German, in fact, and had a lovely German accent. And the most incredible face, as you can see there. She began her career in Germany, playing very naughty girls, like this one. And she was the first woman to dress as a man. The first uh, uh, sort of androgynous superstar, if you will. She was very famous for this look, wearing a man's tuxedo and top hat. But in her private life, she wore pantsuits constantly. In fact, the mayor of Paris told her that if, he, if she ever wore a pantsuit in his city again, she would be banned from Paris for life. She carried on wearing pantsuits in Paris, and of course she wasn't banned. But still, she was really quite a revolutionary dresser and had a look. And take a look at this picture. She absolutely corresponded to that uh, 1930s aesthetic, didn't she? That beauty aesthetic with those very thin arched brows. 
and everybody channels Marlena Dietrich. Everybody. That's Kate, Kate Moss doing Dietrich. That's Madonna. She's always doing Dietrich. Beyonce doing Dietrich. This is uh, Kylie Minogue doing Dietrich. Everybody goes back and does Marlena Dietrich because she was so iconic, so interesting, so exotic. And this is another fashion shoot, obviously inspired by, by Marlena Dietrich. So this is why you have to learn your movie icons. Because fashion goes back to them time and time again. And here is a quote from Marlena. I dress for the image. Not for myself, not for the public, not for fashion, not for men. She dressed for the image she had created. A fabulous woman. I love my Lena Dietrich. Our cultural hotspot for the 1930s was the Riviera, the Mediterranean, the Côte d'Azur. All of that region in the south of France and in Mediterranean Italy, the Riviera. Look at this. This is where the rich went to play. It was a playground for that little 5% of the population in the Great Depression who remained rich or even got richer. Look at what they're wearing. Backless pajama pants they were known as then. We call them palazzo pants now. Take a look at that. What is she doing? She is sunbathing. The 1930s was the first time that suntans became fashionable. All thanks to people going to the French Riviera. And resort collections, which are still part of fashion today, were a product of the wealthy of the 1930s uh, vacationing on the Côte d'Azur. Like this. Pants became acceptable, but only for sport or resort. Take a look at these images here. And these here. And these here. Look at those pants. They are fantastic. Pajama pants, they were known as then. Palazzo pants, we call them today. And those lovely big straw hats. It is such a sophisticated look. I love it. It's so glamorous. The Riviera became so famous for fashion. Look, it even appeared on a postcard here. Uh, Concorde de Pajamas, it's like the uh, uh, competition, a beauty competition or a fashion competition of pajama pants. And here are some recent runway, obviously inspired by the glamorous world of the Riviera and the Mediterranean of the 1930s. Our next style icon of the 30s is somebody who, whose career actually started in the 20s, but who uh, reached the height of their fame in the 30s. And I'm using the word height quite deliberately. Amelia Earhart. I know you already know all about her. She was, as you know, a pilot, an aviatrix, an adventurer, and a remarkable woman by anyone's standards in any decade. She had an extremely iconic look with her leather flying jacket and hat. But did you know that she uh, was also a designer or rather she put her name to a luggage collection and a fashion collection. Sportswear by Amelia Earhart. Here, Amelia Earhart adopts Lastex in her new sportswear designs. Fashion loves Amelia Earhart and goes back to her often, so I felt she deserved a mention in this PowerPoint. And here is a lovely quote from Amelia Earhart, and one that I actually uh, adopted at the beginning of this course when I was told to put a 50,000 year history of fashion and culture together. The most effective way to do it 
is to do it. <laughs> I really did uh, think of that quote when I thought, oh my God, how the hell am I going to approach this? It's so much work and all these PowerPoints. I just sat down and I opened the laptop and I remembered this quote, the most effective way to do it is to do it. And so I did it and I'm still doing it. But uh, Amelia's adventures bring us to our next cultural hotspot of the 30s, Africa. People were obsessed with Africa. The rich went on safari to Africa, you see. And Africa just became a bit of a craze. It's why Tarzan appeared in the movies in the 1930s. And of course, the biggest 30s movie star was literally the biggest 30s movie star, King Kong. All about Africa, which is why we see leopard and cheetah for the very first time, either real or faux or in print in the 1930s. It was all part of the craze for Africa. Another designer of the decade, Adrian. He was called Gilbert Adrian, but he just went by Adrian. Here are some of Adrian's glamorous designs. That dress with the leaping horses may be one of my favorite dresses in the whole of fashion history. He was uh, terribly glamorous, both in life and in his designs. And here is another famous Adrian dress that I bet you all know. Yes. Adrian designed the costumes for The Wizard of Oz. He was a costume designer in Hollywood for movies, but he also had a couture line. And this means that he also designed the most famous shoes of all time, the ruby slippers. I would love you all to see this movie. Adrian designed the clothes. It's called The Women from 1939. The Women, It's All About Men. It is a wonderful film uh, for many, many reasons. It has an all-female cast. No men are in it at all. And it's black and white. But suddenly, in the middle of the movie, for no reason at all, there's a 10-minute Technicolor fashion show with Adrian's designs. I think you'll really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Everything that we've been looking at in the 1930s has been so glamorous and pretty and beautiful, such escapism. But let's not forget this is the Great Depression, so let's take a look at clothing on the wrong side of the rainbow. For so many people, the Great Depression was the most devastating, devastating life experience. People really brought so tragically close to the edge. You would think that fashion wouldn't play into their world view at all. But of course it does. People are people, aren't they? I know however broke I've ever been, I've always still cared about fashion. And there was a little, an absolutely heartbreaking fashion moment in the Great Depression called the feed sack dress. Let me explain what that was. Feed sack or seed sack. Some people say feed sack, some people say seed sack. See this guy here, he's delivering flour in this instance. He could just as well be delivering uh, feed for chickens. And you'll notice that the cloth sacks that he is carrying all have a design on them. They all have a pattern, sort of a calico pattern. This is what happened in the Great Depression. Feed manufacturers started packaging feed for chicken in these uh, sort of colorful calico sacks. Why? So that uh, the women who were living in the Dust Bowl, the very, very worst of the Great Depression, after they'd fed all their chickens with the seed, they could then turn the sacks into dresses. This is so heartbreaking. And here is a very rare picture of a family in the Great Depression living on the Dust Bowl. Um, it's rare because it's color. 
and you'll see that all of those kids are wearing clothes made out of feed sacks. We're looking at what life was like on the wrong side of the rainbow during the 1930s brings us perfectly to our final style icon from the 1930s. This gal here, do you know who she is? She's Bonnie Parker. And I think you know who she is, right? Bonnie Parker was one half of Bonnie and Clyde. They were bank robbers. They were uh, murderers. They were uh, pretty dreadful kids. And kids is the operative word. Bonnie Parker was only about your age when she was uh, doing these naughty, naughty things. She was extremely, <laughs> extremely sassy. Um, not the most admirable person in the world. Um, I think she and her boyfriend, Clyde Barrow, um, they were both part of the Barrow gang. This was an era of bank robbers and gangs. Um, I think they killed maybe 17 people, shot them. Um, so really not very nice people. And yet strangely iconic. As you can see there, she was rather trendy. And this is a rare close-up of Bonnie Parker. And you can see she is adhering to the 1930s makeup aesthetic. They were wanted, look, wanted for murder, bank robbery, kidnap and auto theft. Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow, alias Bonnie and Clyde, they were so famous in their, their day. People loved hearing about Bonnie and Clyde. Why? Because it was adventurous. It took them out of their own miserable um, world. But also, Bonnie and Clyde robbed banks and, you know, the banks had screwed us and they were screwing the banks. So they became sort of folk heroes in the same way bank robber John Dillinger became a folk hero. Sadly, it all came to a horrible end. Well, actually, not so sadly. They were terrible when the feds finally caught up with them and there was a terrible bloodbath shootout. And there you can see Bonnie's body slumped in that car. And then in the late 1960s, their story, which uh, uh, had sort of been forgotten, was depicted on film. Bonnie and Clyde. Look at this movie poster. They're young, they're in love, and they kill people. The movie starred Faye Dunaway, an actress called Faye Dunaway, and there she is. And note what she is wearing in her depiction of Bonnie Parker. She's wearing that tight little sweater with a short sleeve, a pencil skirt, which the real Bonnie wouldn't have worn because pencil skirts came about uh, a little bit later. Um, but she's still wearing a much longer skirt than a mini skirt, which is what people wore in the 1960s. She has that uh, neckerchief tied around her neck, the blonde bob and the beret. When this movie came out, Faye Dunaway's wardrobe, this look in Bonnie and Clyde, became an absolute fashion craze and it genuinely helped bring about the death of the miniskirt. People saw Bonnie and Clyde, they wanted long skirts again. But this look, Faye Dunaway's wardrobe in Bonnie and Clyde, the movie from the late 60s, has been channeled, if you will, tributed, redone, revamped, rewired and rehashed in fashion more times than I can possibly possibly count. Here are just a few recent uh, editorials that feature Faye Dunaway's look in Bonnie and Clyde. Believe it or not, that's Gwyneth Paltrow channeling Faye Dunaway in Bonnie and Clyde. Beyonce doing Faye Dunaway in Bonnie and Clyde. And here is a quote from the real Bonnie. Never go crooked. It's for the love of a man that I'm going to have to die. Pretty good advice. <laughs>